Amen. Good morning, everyone. Take your hymnals. Turn to hymn number 395. Standing on the promises. We have to stand, right? 395. We'll sing the first and last verses. Standing on the promises of Christ my King, through eternal ages let His praises ring. Glory in the highest I will shout and sing, standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God my Savior. Standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises I cannot fall, listening every moment to the Spirit's call, resting in my Savior as my all in all, standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior, standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for your many, many promises, uh, promises that are always kept, and we can stand on them, we can trust in them, we can count on them. Please help us today, Lord, with the class. Speak to our hearts. Give us exactly what we need through your word. I pray that you'll do the same in every class. Bless our church. Give us a great morning, great night. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Let me get a drink of water. <coughs> well, I would. So much for that. Uh, 385. 385. Trying to remember who my water person is today. Huh. They forgot me. Trust, well, trust and obey, right? Amen. When we walk with the Lord in the light of his word, what a glory he sheds on our way. While we do his good will, he abides with us still, and with all who will trust and I believe Steve's going to get me some water. <coughs> and I know, where, I know where the water girl is. She's in Pennsylvania. And so, uh, uh, yes, it just hit me that the cooks are out of town. Not all the cooks. Tim Cook is still here. Pray for him. He's all alone, suffering. Isn't that sad? Well, him and Jeff. So him and the dog are... Um, Suffering together, and I wonder who's suffering most. It's a tough call, right? <coughs> anyway, praise God, the smoke is going away, right? And it, how, did anybody else have trouble with the smoke this week? Well, I had a tough time with my asthma. Nobody else did? You did? Oh, here he comes. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Steve. Smoke was uh, pretty tough around here. I did some things for my son and went west a little ways, and it wasn't so bad. And so I, that was good. I was able to be outdoors. I don't know. Um, it was it was interesting. And people say, well, you know, that's proof of climate change. Well, no, it's not. It has nothing. It has to do with humanity being not very smart when they build campfires and and they start fires in, in dry lands and everything else, most of, that's what most of the fires are, is just humans being careless. Sometimes lightning strikes, which lightning has nothing to do with climate change that I know of. 
And so, um, anyway, I'm not trying to be political. I'm just trying to show a little common sense that uh, things like this do happen, and we just have to go on. But they've always happened for years, and before there was ever a combustible motor, combustible engine. So um, <clears throat> the uh, horse and buggy days, they had blackouts too, right? Do you blame the horse exhaust? I mean, we can blame horse exhaust for a lot of things, but probably not for the fires. All right. Well, we are in, uh, we're on lesson number three. Do you need lesson three? Strange scriptures and sayings. First Samuel to Job. Anybody need lesson number three? All right, Jay, we do have some customers here in the front. Anyone else? Amen. All right, so lesson three is uh, covering 1 Samuel to Job. Um, our theme verse, then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. You know, as a pastor, I've found that uh, um, when, when I first became a pastor, I didn't understand anything about the scriptures. I was a new Christian myself. God had called me. I asked him several times, are you sure? Because I didn't know how I was ever going to teach anybody the scriptures. I didn't realize. I, I always thought you could understand the scriptures, and once you did, then that was it. What I've learned over these years is I'm still learning, and you are still learning. I don't care how long you've been saved. I don't care how how much you've studied your Bible, you're going to be learning until you get to heaven, and then we'll know all things. Can, can you imagine what that's going to be like, knowing all things? Be able to understand eternity. My mind can't even fathom eternity um, to, to grasp that. And all the scriptures, the Word of God, it's so powerful, and uh, it is so amazing how I can read a verse in one year, and it helped me with something. And then the next year, read the same verse, and it helped me with something totally different. Yet it's the same scripture, same word. And um, if we can help you understand the scripture by learning some of the customs, some of the culture of that day, then I think it is a good study. It's something good for us to do. Our lesson verse, 1 Peter 1 and verse 10, again reminds us, that um, people have always tried to learn the scriptures. And so studying the scriptures is a good thing. Uh, here the prophets uh, inquire and search diligently. I encourage you and I to search diligently. This class, that's what we do. So let's go ahead and say our lesson verse together. Say the reference, the verse, and the reference, and begin. 1 Peter 1.10 of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you. 1 Peter 1.10. And again, 1 Peter 1.10. Of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you. 1 Peter 1.10. Thank you, Father, for the Word of God, and thank you for uh, clearly showing us through the Scriptures that uh, you want us to study, you want us to search, and you want us to learn. And so I pray that you'll help us to do that in, in these sh uh, short minutes, uh, to, to just study your Scripture, to learn some things, and some things that maybe we did not know before. I pray you'll bless in Jesus' name. Amen. And by the way, this uh, lesson verse is, um, it, it, it's interesting to me because here the prophets are, they're not just called prophets, they are prophets who prophesy. What's that mean? They preach. So these are prophets who preach and they are still inquiring and searching diligently. And so um, when somebody says to me, well, I've been a pastor for years. I remember when I was a young preacher, I, they, and I'd hear them say, well, I've been a, been a pastor for years, and I'm still studying the Bible. I used to think, wow, here I am, a freshman in Bible college, and I thought I'd get it all this year. Yeah, that didn't happen. Now I totally understand what they were saying. Well, we're in 2 Samuel 11, so turn there. Started on this last week and kind of knew that I wouldn't... Um, Finish it, 
But um, anyway, it is, it is David's sin, 2 Samuel 11. And again, we have a, we have a uh, I wouldn't call it a strange scripture. I don't even, don't even necessarily consider it a custom issue. There are some things that are, there are some things that were acceptable in that day that are not so acceptable today uh, as, far as, as far as this sin was concerned. But um, David, uh, the, the amazing part of this to me is he was a man after God's own heart. And uh, David does maybe the worst thing. I, I don't know if there's anything worse in the Bible. In, in, and again, when I say worse, all sin is wrong. I mean, lying is no different than murder in God's eyes. But I'd much rather, if I had to choose one to have over for dinner, I'd rather have the liar than the murderer, personally. But again, in God's eyes, all sin is the same. And so we certainly don't want to uh, make David worse than anybody else because of his sin, but we do recognize that what he did was totally unacceptable. Uh, as far as, ha especially the idea, and, and this is emphasized over and over again in the, uh, in the Bible, um, the murder of Uriah. And so that is kind of what I, I look at. And, uh, and, and the idea of bringing Uriah back, well, we'll get into it. Anyway, so, so we go back to chapter 11 of 2 Samuel, and we started on this, and, and we notice, you know, the first thing David did it came to pass after the year was expired at the time when kings go forth to battle. No accident in Scripture. God wants us to know kings go forth to battle. So if a king doesn't go forth to battle, he's not doing what he's supposed to do. He's not where he's supposed to be. We recognize none of this would have happened if David would have been where he was supposed to be. And it reminds us to be where we're supposed to be. It is important that we are where we're supposed to be. And, uh, and so that is crucial. That, is, that has always been from the first time I, I heard this uh, preached upon, and that was <clears throat> when I was a freshman in Bible college, first time I ever heard it, uh, it was a recognition that, you know what, I'm going to try to be where I'm supposed to be. Uh, it'll keep me out of a lot of trouble. And so David tarried, the Bible says. And so the first thing we notice is he tarried. Then verse 2, it came to pass in an evening tide, that David arose from off his bed and walked upon the roof of the king's house. Now, there could be a lot of things said about David getting out of bed. A lot of things he should have been asleep. What was he worried about? Why wasn't he asleep? Why was he up walking around or on top of the roof of the king's house? By the way, the roof of the king's house was a normal place to walk. It was a normal place to, uh, to, to hang out, if you will. It was a good place to go have cup, a cup of coffee in the morning. Um, but again, David arose, and it was evening tide, and again, he could have been in bed, but it was evening, so he could be up too, and you just don't know. Was David walking around, and I've speculated this, was he walking around because he felt guilty that he wasn't where he was supposed to be? You ever feel guilty? You ever, uh, you know, it's Sunday night, and you know you're supposed to be in church, and, and, and all of a sudden, you know, instead you're watching Walt Disney? Well, that's not anymore. But uh, back in the old days, that was the thing. But you're watching something, and, and, and maybe it's the NBA. Is that still going on? I don't even know. But, but anyway, you're doing something, and, and all of a sudden, oh, you know, I should be in church, and I know I should be in. I don't know what David, I don't know what he was going through. You know, oh, I should be in battle. I wonder, wonder how the battle's going. Anyway, what happens is, because of that, he's walking around, and the Bible says, from the roof, he saw a woman washing herself. And the woman was very beautiful to look upon. And so, again, was the woman, was Bathsheba wrong for being out there washing her? I don't know. I, you know, that's one of those custom things. It, was not, it wasn't necessarily an odd thing for a woman to be within sight of different people. And yet, you know, I've, I've read different things. And so I'm not going to try to be definitive whether Bathsheba should have been out there naked, half naked, or whatever. I, I don't really know uh, the whole thing. I, I would say in that day that for a woman to be outdoors in a public, not when, when I say public, remember that in those days there was, you know, outdoors was public. 
Um, people, you know, it's not like, not like our day where you have fences and all that. They would not have a lot of those things. Uh, but I would say that her being out there uncovered, uh, we know the modesty of women of that day. We know the modesty that, that was expected. Um, but again, to put blame on Bathsheba, I can't necessarily do that. Uh, and we do see that God recognizes Bathsheba later on and blesses her. So I can't be too hard. By the way, you can't be hard on any sinner. I know, Pastor, aren't we independent fundamental Baptists? Yeah, and I, I don't like having the, um, uh, the label that we're hard on sinners because we're sinners. I don't, I don't like having that. I like having the label that we're hard on sin. I preach against sin. I preach against my own sin. Amen. We're, none of us are perfect. There's no Sunday school teacher teaching our children today that, that, that they're not going to teach something that they do. They've done. Because we're all sinners. None of us are perfect. Amen. I know we don't like to amen that. Um, but anyway, it is so true. So anyway, he sees her. Now, uh, the Bible says he, and the, and, uh, he saw a woman washing herself. And so as soon as he saw that, what should he have done? He should have gone back in. Right. He didn't have, you know, you know, he didn't have to sit there and look at her and stare and get out his binoculars. Oh, they didn't have binoculars. No. So he didn't have to do that. He saw, and, and again, you know, what are you seeking? What was David? I don't know if David was seeking that. David had David had had a wife. David had concubine. David had access to women. That wasn't the issue. And so, and again, there's another one of those customs and things to look at that, huh? That's interesting. Well, God made it clear. Jesus made it clear in the New Testament. He he. God has always allowed some things because of the hardness of our hearts. So anyway, we won't get into all that. But um, you've heard the saying that you, you know, if a bird lands on your head, you shoo it off. If you let it build a nest there, you're not very bright. Amen. And so David wasn't very bright when it came to a beautiful woman. And uh, so he sent and inquired after the woman. And one said, is not this Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? Now, what does that mean? What all happens in David's mind? Again, the custom, the, the, the day, and what's, well, David knew who Uriah the Hittite was, and David knew exactly where Uriah the Hittite was, and David knew that Uriah the Hittite was where he was supposed to be, and also where David was supposed to be. He was fighting the battle. It was a time when kings go forth to battle. And David knew, oh, Uriah is not home. Well, so verse 4, David sent messengers and took her. And she came in unto him, and he lay with her. Now, again, when the king sends for the, the woman, uh, again, custom, and that day, uh, you could say, well, the Bible says she came in unto him. In, in reality, she didn't have a whole lot of choice because the king has sent for her. We see that several times in Scripture and customs and different things. So again, if you want to be hard on Bathsheba, you're welcome to be hard on her. But someday when you get to heaven, you'll find that it didn't matter that you were hard on her. And maybe you should look at your own wife. Hello. But anyway, um, so many things. We have to be very, very careful. Of. So, so he took her, the Bible says, and he lay with her, for she was purified from her uncleanness, and she returned unto her house. And verse 5, the woman conceived. Now again, David had not planned that. She had not planned that. Nobody had planned that. In other words, she is now with child. Okay? Uriah is in the battle, so it cannot possibly be his child. Mm. And now, because David had not planned that, David had not figured that part out, 
You say, well, he should have. And stupidity often kicks in when we sin. That'd be a good quote. Stupidity often kicks in when we sin. You know, we're, it's, it's like, what in the world was I not thinking? Or what was I thinking? And this is very, very evident with David here, where uh, obviously he had uh, not... Not prayed about it and not sought any kind of guidance. And all of a sudden, she says to David, I am with child. So, now, what is David going to... And that's, that's where, again, again, I'm not, I'm not trying to de-emphasize that sin. I'm trying to say, in God's eyes, what David did next was unheard of. And God would not let that go by. And so verse 6, David sent to Joab saying, Send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent Uriah to David. Now Uriah was fighting the battle. David calls for his his, uh, captain, Joab, to bring Uriah home. Because David has a plan. By the way, David's plan is absolutely perfect. Except that it wasn't. In David's mind, this plan was perfect. This might be one of the most unbelievable parts of this whole story because Uriah the Hittite had not been with his wife for a long period of time and surely Uriah is going to want to be with his wife. Therefore, the baby that is born, it'll be obvious it was Uriah's and it's all going to work out. And that is exactly what David is thinking. Things don't always work out the way you think. And so Joab sent Uriah to David. And when Uriah was come unto him, David demanded of him how Joab did, how the people did, how the war prospered. By the way, David should have already known that because he should have been there himself. (laughs) Remember that. David said to Uriah, go down to thy house and wash thy feet. Uriah departed out of the king's house. There followed him a mess of meat from the king. So the king has a party planned. For Uriah and his wife Bathsheba, so that they can spend time together, and the baby that is born will be Uriah's baby, according to what everybody thinks, including Uriah. And everybody will be happy. <laughs> Except for verse 9. But Uriah slept at the door of the king's house. And so the barbecued ribs, the ribeye steaks, the, the mess, the Bible says, of meat from the king, it all went to the house, but where was Uriah? He slept at the door of the king's house with all the servants of his lord and went not down to his house. What in the world is wrong with this man? I mean, come on, Uriah. You haven't been with your wife. Your wife's a beautiful woman. You haven't been with your wife in all these days. I mean, this to David... This is the perfect plan. And when they had told David, saying, Uriah went not down unto his house, David said unto Uriah, Camest thou not from thy journey? Why then didst thou not go down unto thine house? David couldn't believe it. What is wrong with you, Uriah? I mean, come on. Well, Uriah had more character than David. That's what was wrong with him. And Uriah said unto David, The ark and Israel and Judah abide in tents. And my lord Joab and the servants of my lord are encamped in the open fields. Shall I then go into mine house to eat and to drink and to lie with my wife? As thou livest and as thy soul liveth, I will not do this thing. Oh, what is wrong with that guy? Well, he's, he's faithful to his leadership. <laughs> and now David, you know, can you imagine David? He has a perfect plan. But Uriah, because he has character, and he's loyal to Joab, the captain, David said to Uriah, verse 12, "'Tarry here today also, and tomorrow I will let thee depart.'" So Uriah abode in Jerusalem that day and the morrow. And again, in David's mind, he's thinking, okay, Uriah is close to his wife. He's going to want to be with his wife. 
He's going to want to spend some time with his way. He's going to, he's, he's going to give in. The Bible says when David had called him, he did eat and drink before him, and he made him drunk. And at even he went out to lie on his bed with the servants of his Lord, but went not down to his house. David, one more time, he tries to get Uriah to go be with his wife to cover up his sin. But Uriah, his loyalty overcame his drunkenness even. It's really amazing. It's, you know, every time I read this in my mind, I, I envision David saying, oh, what is wrong with this guy? Mm. And, and so the plot here, verses 14 to 17, and again, we deal with custom. We deal, one of, probably to me, the most, just an amazing passage of Scripture and, and the way that it was done. Because again, you don't have radios, you don't have uh, phones, you don't have any other method other than giving somebody a message. Now watch what happens. Verse 14. It came to pass in the morning that David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah. David writes a letter. We're going to look at the letter here in a minute. But he gives that letter to Uriah to take to Joab because that's how, that's how they did it. And he wrote in the letter saying, Set ye Uriah in the forefront of the hottest battle and retire ye from him that he may be smitten and die. Wait a minute. He writes the letter. And the letter says, I want Uriah to die in battle. Joab, make it happen. And he gives that letter to Uriah to deliver to Joab. Verse 16, it came to pass when Joab observed the city that he assigned Uriah unto a place where he knew that valiant men were and the men of the city went out and fought with Joab, and there fell some of the people of the servants of David, and Uriah the Hittite died also. Wow. The letter, to me, I, I, it's, it's so hard for me to even fathom that Uriah carried the letter that told Joab to let him die. And that was the plan. And Uriah was so loyal to David, to Joab, he didn't read the letter. You and I, would we have read the letter? Yeah. Well, nobody will know. Nobody, I mean, come on. Okay, somebody, somebody says, well, it would have the king's seal and all that. Yeah, but they, they, didn't, they couldn't seal things like we seal things. You, you could get past that king's seal, believe me. Mm. But Uriah was so loyal, he didn't open it. Wow. And we skip, so he dies, and, and David finds out. Verse 26, when the wife of Uriah heard that Uriah, her husband, was dead, she mourned for her husband and when the morning was past, David sent and fetched her to his house, and she became his wife and bare him a son. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. Wow. Again, you know, you have, how in the world could Uriah be trusted? Because you trusted your soldiers in those days. You, you, you had, people had character. People, people did right. People, you, you just, you know, here's, here's a soldier in the army. You know he's not going to read that letter. You know, David knew, okay, my last plan didn't work. And it was all because of Uriah's loyalty to the leadership. So it didn't work. So I'm going to use his loyalty now. And I'm going to write a letter and give it to him. And he'll give it to Joab. Joab will read it. You have to figure Joab is looking at Uriah thinking, he doesn't understand. He just delivered me his death warrant. 
It's, it's an amazing story to me, the whole thing. It, by the way, could David have had a better friend than Uriah? I doubt it. If, if he'd had friends like that, and again, the king had some, but I mean, Uriah proved his loyalty. He wouldn't even, he wouldn't even go be with his wife and, and, and in his home because Joab and the army was out in tents in the field fighting. He wouldn't even, I mean, he wouldn't even do that. What a, what a loyal soldier this man was. And David had him murdered. Well, <clears throat> the Bible says the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. Again, I, I'm not trying to push aside what he did as far as the uh, adultery with Bathsheba, but I, I, I'm the thing that really disgusted God, we read about it in 2 Samuel 12. And, and you know, the whole time as a new Christian, again, I was a new Christian when I went to Bible college, hadn't been saved very long, all this was new to me. And the whole thing, that, the thing that really amazed me the most as I was learning this from uh, in, in our church with Pastor Taylor is how the Bible didn't hide this. Because I always heard about David being such a great guy. But the Bible shows us this story. I remember thinking, as, as Pastor Taylor preached on this, I remember thinking, I wonder why God's telling us this. <laughs> I wonder why God, I mean, it seems like he would have hid this. But the truth is, God doesn't do that. He doesn't cover things up. Sin is sin. He wants us to see sin. That's what the law is all about. The law is all about showing us that we're sinners. The law is about us, us not thinking the only sin out there is murder. The only sin out there is stealing. The only sin out there is lying. No, the Bible is, is so clear to show us there's nothing that we can do to undo our sin. It's not possible. And so the Bible is all about that. And so the Bible's not going to cover up sin. By the way, it didn't cover up the result of sin either, ever. And so David is confronted by Nathan, the independent, fundamental, Bible-believing Baptist preacher. Or as the Bible calls him, Nathan the prophet. I threw in the other stuff. That's in the authorized Rogers version. The Lord sent Nathan unto David. He came unto him and said unto him, There were two men in one city, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had exceeding many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing save one little ewe lamb, which he had bought and nourished up, and it grew up together with him with his children. It did eat of his own meat and drank of his own cup and lay in his bosom and was unto him as a daughter. There came a traveler unto the rich man, and he spared to take of his own flock and of his own herd to dress for the wayfaring man that was come unto him, but took the poor man's lamb and dressed it for the man. It was come. So, so this rich man had all of his flock, and he gets a traveler that needs a lamb to eat, and he takes the poor man's lamb. Notice what happens in verse 5. David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. And he said to Nathan, As the Lord liveth, the man that hath done this thing shall surely die. So in other words, David cannot believe that anyone would ever, somebody that has all, these, all this flock, all these things, somebody who's rich and they have all these things, and here's this poor person who has very little, and, and that we're going to rob from that poor guy and take what he has, the one thing he has, and, and, and we're going we're gonna, to, I mean, he said, that guy, that guy's in big trouble. And David makes his pronouncement, he shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and because he had no pity. Oh, these words in verse 7. Nathan said to David, thou art the man. And notice we said, I anointed thee king over Israel. I delivered thee out of the hand of Saul. I gave thee thy master's house and thy master's wives into thy bosom and gave thee the house of Israel and of Judah. And if that had been too little, I would moreover have given unto thee such and such things. Wherefore hast thou despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? Thou hast killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword. 
and has taken his wife to be thy wife and has slain him with the sword of the children of Ammon. That's exactly what David did. Now therefore the sword shall never depart from thine house because thou hast despised me, hast taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be thy wife. And thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will raise up evil against thee out of thine own house, and I will take thy wives before thine eyes and give them unto thy neighbor. He shall lie with thy wives in the sight of this son. By the way, all of that happened uh, with Absalom when he rebelled against his father, David. And so David did pay, as he said, fourfold. So David was confronted, thou art the man, and David uh, obviously went through exactly what he pronounced. He said, he shall restore the lamb fourfold. Now again, he killed Uriah, and that was the crime, because killing Uriah made it possible for David then to take Bathsheba as his own wife. And so, <clears throat> David's effort to cover this whole thing up uh, by killing Uriah the Hittite, again, he got away with it in the eyes of man, but not in the eyes of God. And God said, I'm going to deal with this. You've killed Uriah the Hittite. And again, very clear, he says that in verse 9. Um, you'll notice here, I gave thee thy master's house and thy master's, notice plural, Wives, David had David had women any any amount any woman. I mean, David had them. Why does he take the one, one man kills the man to take his wife? And that's why God said, "No, you're not going to do that." So David does get right with God. Psalm fifty one, and you ought to write in your Bible Psalm fifty one after this, and it is a beautiful psalm. It is a psalm that you and I should, should know. We should know where it is. We should know what it says. We should know how it applies to all of us because we all need Psalm 51. Because you say, well, I've never done anything like that. No, but you've sinned. I've sinned. We've all sinned. And David says in verse 1 of Psalm 51, have mercy. And that's what we need. We need God's mercy. The Bible says his mercies are new every morning. Why? Because we need his mercy every day. There's never, there's never a day that goes by that we don't need the mercy of God. Whether it's our thoughts, our actions, our words, what we listen to, what we look at. What, I mean, whatever it may be, there's something that is, that is sinful within our life every day. David, David finally, get, you know, have mercy upon me. I need your mercy. If you and I, look, if you're not asking God for his mercy, now again, we understand salvation. We understand, but, but I mean, I, I want to remind you of, um, of so many times in the Bible, especially in the, uh, in the Old Testament. I mean, I mean, God deals with things, you know, and, and sometimes it's, it's, just, it's just instant. Um, um, and even in the New Testament, with Ananias and Sapphira, who lied. They just lied to God about their giving, about their tithing record, about their giving record. They lied. And one dies, second one dies, just like that. And again, have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions. And thank God for the blood of Jesus, because without the blood of Jesus, our transgressions cannot be blotted out. Blot them out, God. But have you asked God to blot them out? Have you recognized, I'm sinful? Wash me, he said, thoroughly from my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin, for I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Against thee and thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest and be clear when thou judgest. And he goes on, Psalm 51 is so important. Um, he, he, he says, restore unto me the joy, verse 12, the joy of thy salvation. He never says restore my salvation because you don't have to have your salvation restored. But that joy, what you were missing, David had missed for a year because of this. And so, restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. So David was forgiven. 
And I think one of the great lessons of, Psalm, or of, of this passage is David was forgiven, but he did, in fact, suffer the fourfold judgment that he called upon in verse 6 for the story that Nathan told. He said, okay, David, what would you do if somebody took some rich person that had a whole flock of lambs, took the one lamb from the poor person, what would you do about that, David? David said, he'll restore the lamb fourfold. And Nathan told him that he would suffer that judgment. So how did he suffer? Well, first of all, Bathsheba's baby died. So that baby that was born, that baby died. And when, when in verse 13, let's, I, I need to look at that, verse 13 of chapter 12, David said unto Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said unto David, The Lord also hath put away thy sin. Praise God. He puts away our sin. That means it's blotted out. And that's, that, that's only blotted out because of the blood of Jesus, because David believed. And that, that's a whole other message. But notice what the Bible does say. Howbeit, because by this deed thou hast given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme, the child also that is born unto thee shall surely die. And, and, and that whole story right there, um, that was one of the four things that was going to take place that David himself had decided the judgment that was going to happen. And uh, the baby died, Bathsheba's baby died. That was a terrible thing. Uh, by the way, all through that time, and I please don't miss this. All through that time, David has gotten right with God. David's joy of his salvation is restored. But David besought God for the child before that child died. You say, well, God already said it was going to die. But David begged God. You say, well, I, he should have known better. Well, David said in verse 22, and I've preached on this before. He said, who can tell whether God will be gracious to me? that the child may live. I don't care what you've done. Who can tell whether God will be gracious? What's grace? It's giving us what we don't deserve. I got news for you. God shows his grace over and over and over. But the child does die. And, um, and, and then his daughter Tamar is raped by Amnon, his son, and a whole story there. Amnon, his son, is killed by Absalom, his son. And Absalom rebels against David. So we have fourfold judgment that David himself proclaimed. Absalom rebels against his father. The prophecy Nathan gave about David's wives in the sight of all of Jerusalem were taken by Absalom. That all took place. And so Absalom rebels, and then Absalom's killed. And so the fourfold judgment that David himself proclaimed took place, just like God said, just like Nathan the prophet said. And yet, in the midst of all of that, please do not miss this. God's mercy and God's grace on David should be inspiration for every one of us because God still used David. I don't care. I don't care what you've done. I don't care how bad you and I may think it is. I don't care how good you may think it is. <laughs> In other words, well, I'm not as bad as so-and-so. Yeah, I know. None of us are. But I promise you this. God can always use you. It's all he has to use. He has never, never, other than his own son who came down and was perfect, he's never had a perfect person to use. Go through your Bible. In fact, I'm working on a message. I've preached the same kind of message many times. Uh, the idea that, that God can use any of us, anybody. Doesn't matter who you are, doesn't matter what you've done. God can use you. And it's all he has. I'm not as bad as, that's not the issue. 
What you need to be as good as Jesus, and there's only one way to be that, and that is call upon him to save your soul and, and let his blood take away your sin. That's why we sing, what can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Thank you, Father, for your mercy and your grace in our lives. We see it maybe not any better than in the story of King David. And we, again, are amazed. And yet we shouldn't be amazed at how far David would go because of our own sin. And, uh, and Lord, I pray that you would, again, help us always to keep a short account with you, to get things right with you, to pray, to talk to you about that sin, to not let it go as David did for, for at around a year, we guess, and, uh, and Lord, to just to, to try to stay right with you. I pray you bless our morning, speak to our hearts, in Jesus' name, amen. Take a few minutes and have the morning service.